All right. You once told me that when you saw the clock getting to be a little after four o'clock and leaning towards five o'clock in your time zone, what did you do to keep your research going? You, you told me that you called other time zones. Oh, you, of course you, I did. I you, love BC. Thank goodness for the West, Alan. You, you, you kept a bunch of contacts in universities and NGOs in a different right. time zone. Oh, and totally. I, I think that resourcefulness uh, is something that the average public affairs shop doesn't uh, necessarily show. And it's a great little trick. Oh, it's a wonderful trick. So when you know when everybody is closed down here, so you're going out west, or you've got your European time zones, uh, it's very important. But I think in journalism, the most important thing you're working with most of the time is your telephone book and your time zone understanding. Over all the editorials, op-eds, columns, etc., influence that you had at, at the Star, you've mentioned a couple, but have you already mentioned what you think maybe is your biggest success? Um, as an editorial writer, answering that directly to you now was the work I did um, on Henry Morgenthaler and the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada. Early in your career? Uh, quite early in, in my career. And I do remember working on, on the editorial after the decision and, um, um, and I do remember the publisher appearing in my office <laughs> and watching every word as it flowed through my, my fingers. This is what I was at, at the star. To me, I felt part of history and I felt that I played a role as an editorial writer in our history because the Toronto Star had gone very much to bat for the, the freedom of choice of, of women. Now, what, and wasn't the issue in part the integrity of a jury trial that a, a judge... Oh, very heard? much so. That's where I would do my insight writing uh, and, and it was about the, the power of, of jurors to decide cases not based on the law but based on, on their, their compassion. Mm -hmm. wow. uh, and now, how, how about failure? I mean, one that you either didn't get published, you shouldn't have published, that, that you kind of cringe and regret. Now's the time. <laughs> this this is at the time. Um, I can't think of any, any real failure. I can see society never changes as quickly as I would like to, to see it change. In that sense, perhaps. Uh, Not one if I had here favorite. and could read it that you'd go, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. No, I oh. never had that. I never had that. Well, good for you. That experience. I've never come back to the paper and said, hey, we have to change our point of view on this issue. I misled you. I got it wrong. Um, that, that's never been an experience. Now, some of this discussion, you know, I really haven't raised one of the fundamental issues, and that is, you know, what is journalism? There are different uh, uh, definitions. What is the role of a newspaper? We have seen over the years uh, the swashbuckling, flamboyant, uh, press baron, freedom of the press is for those who own one, you give me the pictures, I'll give you the war, uh, advocates for their own particular causes. We've seen community-based journalism, which is essentially boosterism. We have Phil Graham who said uh, journalism is the first rough draft of history because it's warts and all. The Atkinson principles at the Toronto Star uh, speak of good works and social justice and so on. Uh, what's your view of all of these definitions? I, I know that the Toronto Star stands for many things that I believe in as an individual. Uh, civil liberties, uh, protections for people who are accused of crimes, there's a positive role for governments to play in our lives. But my passion in journalism um, has always been of an investigative sort, the role of the, of the media to, uh, to expose many things that should be exposed. Uh, so Upton Sinclair and his exposing oh, of the meatpacking industry? Absolutely. High on your list? Absolutely. Um, it's sort of the opposite when you think of it, of what we've been talking about, the editorial board, writing editorials in the hope that people with the power uh, in the legislature, in the parliament, are, are going to be influenced by them. The greatest moment I had is when I was working on uh, the story of Ipperwash. Ipperwash is when a native named Dudley George was killed during a siege of Ipperwash Provincial Park. And after working on the story and exposing the police lies and the government lies, I was invited uh, out to the army base and on the wall was every single word that I had written and my colleague Peter Edwards had written. And these are the people, these are people who would be forgotten, these are people, dogs were set on them that night at Ipperwash, a whole lie that they had had guns and fired on them was put together. We were there for them. Mm. And that, to me, is what journalism is all about. I mean, we do all the other stuff as reporters. I've done essentially the tea parties, the political movement, 
movements, uh, local politics, all that is important. And newspapers are papers of record. It's a big function. But it's this idea of being able to dig in and do things and be an eye, watching on government, politics, those with power. Uh, that, to me, is the ultimate job that we have to do because no one else is going to do it. So you're not keen on the idea that a newspaper's fundamental role is to sell advertising. No. And you're not keen on the idea that the fundamental role of television is to sell consumers to advertisers. I'm not keen on those ideas, uh, but I do acknowledge that for me to do my investigative stories, for me and Peter Edwards to be allowed to roam on a story for three years and do very little else is a very expensive process. Now, in television, uh, when, and, and I know a version of this happens in print as well, but in television, when a, uh, an organization is covering a scandal, such as O.J. Simpson, Gary Condit, uh, salacious, uh, scandalous stuff, and when the anchor says, elsewhere in the news, you see the ratings drop. When the anchor says, back to the Condit affair, the ratings go back up. It would take nerves of steel to stick with the social justice issues and the kind of things you're interested in when you see that vote with the remote right. that the viewer will have. And the same thing it, at, the, at the newspaper box. They buy it, they don't buy it based on the headline. It's a dilemma for you, isn't it? I don't see it as a dilemma. Uh, I, I measure my work as a journalist in what resulted in Ipperwash, um, in exposing the, the cover-ups in the people of, of Kettle Point and Ipperwash finally getting back their park and all the lies being exposed. This to me is enough. Uh, I'm not the one who's looking at the books, the figures. Uh, that, that doesn't affect me in, in the least. Yes, I've had my disappointments in the news business. Uh, stories that I couldn't quite get into the paper, stories where I put in a great deal of time, a, a year, sometimes two years, and it didn't pan out. Uh, there, there's where you do have many disappointments. Uh, but whether uh, ads are being sold or not sold, that to me is, leave that to other people. I'm, I'm a reporter and I'm just going to do that work. You said you'd sometimes interview 30 people uh, when you're uh, covering a story. You did that for many, many, many years. You've asked lots of questions. I have. You have an active mind. So, over to you, Harold. What did I forget to ask you? What, what were the good questions I should have asked you? What, in what way do you want to grill yourself today? If I was going to grill my, myself, um, I, I might just say, Harold, you're at a point when you're kind of looking back at a career in journalism. Was it worth it? I, I would have to answer absolutely yes. Um, I just wish I would have gotten into it a little earlier than 13, but other, otherwise it's a remarkable profession. Uh, I feel that, that you can do one hell of a lot of good. Yeah, you're, you're a late bloomer, uh, there's no question, waiting until age 13. Yes. I, I sat on a little pretend editorial board with you at our university uh, magazine, and I say pretend because <laughs> you weren't being paid to do it. But I did notice that you were, you were not the hard-boiled journalist. You were remarkably uh, empathetic to certain issues, features, things that would have been considered um, irrelevant to, to some people pretending to be the hard-boiled journalist. Talk to me about that, because you were well into your career by the time I met you there. Right. I, one, one of the dangers in, in journalism today uh, is as budgets are drying up and um, newspapers don't have as much money as they had, is that more and more you, you see reporting of press releases in some publications. People just taking the information that they're getting from the government, Alan. And um, that's not news. This is just something meant to get you to, to write the view of whoever is providing it with you. Um, I think empathy is a big part of it, but just a, a real understanding of, of, of news is something that, that's examined and measured and news content is measured um, and stories are thought of and considered. There's a whole set of values that goes with the news process and that to me is what is very, very important. Well, I'm grateful as they do at Le Monde. We've been standing for our entire discussion. It has been empathetic, uh, interesting, insightful, and you have proven yourself to be a master of the art of journalism. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Alan. <laughs>